Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Welcome back to the Joy of SharePoint webinar series. Um, I have with me three of my co-workers from Pate Group, Ashley Rogers, Rob Windsor, and Terrence McCleary. Welcome, guys. How are you all today? Doing great, thanks. That was yep, really good, thank you. Awesome. Terrence, chime in. Yes, great. <laughs> So it's officially fall, summer's over. Um, we've got all of our vacations probably mostly over and done with for the, the warm weather season. So all the kiddos are back to school. So I guess we're, we're back to full force work. Uh, let me see here, it's right at 11.30, 11.31. All you guys that are joining in, so glad you're here. I hope you have your caffeinated beverage of choice because we are back with power. Um, I'll have to play my GIF. This is a GIF. I love it. I was inspired by Spider-Man when I was working on slides. So there's a little bit of a Spider-Man theme here. We'll tie it all in at the end. But uh, as a few folks are starting to come in, welcome, welcome, welcome back. And we're gonna kick it off. So I've got a couple of introductory slides. Yes, back with power. There's our Spider-Man for the, for the day. So Ashley, I've got you with us. You're gonna be walking us through how to approve Teams channels using Flow. And I think you've got some other goodies for us too, am I right? Yeah, that's right, a couple of extras in there too. Love it. It's a little too early for trick or treat, but uh, we'll never turn down extra goodies. <laughs> um, any of you that wanna follow Ashley on Twitter, I've got her twi Twitter handle up there, Ashley K. Hillier and then a rogers at paygroup.com next up on the roster terrence mcclearly the real terrence mcclearly by the way so we got his twitter handle up there terrence so you're going to walk us through some power apps magic i hear uh yes we're going to focus on forms and enhancing forms for our end users that's a hot topic every time i am on a client site and they're asking about power apps and can i do this or can i do this do i need an app do i need a list you know there's a happy medium where you don't always have to go full app but you can turn your sharepoint forms into something special so i'm glad you're going to walk through that with us and then last but never ever ever least we have rob windsor rob how are you today i'm doing well I'm a little intimidated I'm, by your topic. I'm ready to handle my errors. Woo! <laughs> Lord. And now this could help us also handle our errors, you know, outside of Office 365. Man, that's the golden ticket. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to take a look at how to handle specific errors and how uh -huh. to handle sort of generic errors. And in the time I have available, I'm going to focus mostly on notifications of errors. Okay, fantastic. What about bad life decisions? Anything for that? Oh, geez. <laughs> well, if I had that solved, I, I, I'd be in a lot better position than I am now. Okay. That's a longer webinar. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the joy of SharePoint self-help edition. <laughs> so I have a question from Christy. Yes, this is being recorded and it will be available along with the slide deck. So we have, a, I think Ashley provided us with some slides. Rob has a, uh, a blog that walks through this too. So you'll have lots of good information and Terrence is going purely on live demo that I think that makes him the bravest of us all but um all of this will be available Lisa hey hey good to see you too all right all the folks chiming in on chat feel free as we go guys if you're new to the joy of SharePoint you know this is not a form uh well you may not know this is not a formal environment if you have a question go ahead and drop it in chat um if the person doing their demo is deep down in the weeds i'll be happy to try to take it on or you know we'll answer it as we go we're also going to have some time at the end for questions and answers so join in the conversation and questions anytime okay let's get going with ashley she's going to do a demo for approving new teams channels using flow and ashley i think you can take over presenting your desktop Okay, great. Let's go ahead and try that. And if you need me to advance slides instead of de demoing, uh, demoing this point, I can do that too. I just had to make myself a presenter. There you go. 
Alrighty, so can you guys see, uh, Joy, can you go ahead and let me know if you can see my marketing uh, team site here? I can, and I see channel oh, requests. Very good. Okay, guys. Um, so as Joy said, um, we're going to be walking you through how to approve a new channel request um, using Flow. And this is a channel request for Teams, of course. Um, and also, as she mentioned, um, these uh, steps are actually available in the slides at the end. So if you forget something, if you don't have time to look at the recording, uh, you should be able to get pretty much everything you need uh, from those few slides that we have. So um, feel free to, of course, ask questions through Joy and uh, she will flag me down if we want to stop and go into anything into detail. Okay, great. So I want to set up um, what we have as our situation here. It, the idea is that maybe you've got a marketing team and maybe as part of the marketing team, you've got some initiatives, of course, um, you know, campaigns and things that the marketing team does throughout the year. Um, and as a team member of marketing, or maybe you're somebody who has access to the marketing team through HR, and maybe you've got an idea for a new campaign. Um, but as a team member, maybe you wanna make a request for a new campaign, um, so for a new channel. So what we have is we've created, we've got our marketing team site. This is in SharePoint. And we've got a channel requests uh, list that I've built inside of SharePoint. And as you can see, it's- you. Go ahead. Can I you for a second? So Absolutely. let's talk about that for half a second. I get this question a lot. Sure. Uh, so she's in her marketing team and she has created a custom list in the team site that's connected to Teams. So sometimes we get a little nervous about really working in that Teams connected team site. But as you can see, Ashley's done that. And you can just keep on truck and making this built out as a fully functional SharePoint site. Yeah, that's a great point. That's actually one of the things I love about Teams and SharePoint working hand in hand is it really is SharePoint behind the scenes of that team. So, you know, if you're familiar with SharePoint, but you're new to Teams, it's really just a nice seamless integration uh, once you once you really understand where all the pieces fit. So, um, as we said, we've got our custom list here, super straightforward. We have a title, we have a new channel name. Uh, and that's going to be what, what you want that channel to be called. Um, I have a multi-line text field called purpose, which I haven't filled out because, you know, the purpose is demo today. But of course, you want to be able to include a description in there. Maybe somebody needs to provide some justification, something like that, to the approver. And then I've got this nifty thing here, which is some JSON column formatting to create um, a submit button for my flow that's attached. Um, so, so that's really cool. That's something that, um, you know, if you wanted that, uh, we could provide that for you. You can Google it. It's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward, very reusable. But it makes a really nice, um, uh, user experience. So let's go, go on over to Teams and I'll show you that in my marketing team, you can see we're in the marketing team, in the uh, general uh, channel, I've got this channel requests, it's the same list we just looked at, it's attached as a tab here, I put it as a, another tab inside the general channel. And this is so that if you want people to just work through Teams, if they don't really want to go to SharePoint to do this, they can just come right here. So the idea is that someone can come in, select this and you know fill this out, create a new request, and then click the submit button, and that's going to run a flow. So before I do that, I'm going to take you, we're going to jump again, we're going to jump over to flow. So we've got the setup here that we've got the SharePoint list, we've got it you know, in Teams, so you can see it in SharePoint, you can see it in Teams, we've got it easy to submit the flow request, uh, but now I'm going to bring you on over back over here to look at the actual flow. So um, important thing to note about this type of flow is that um, what I'm doing here is creating it specifically from that list. So I'll go in and show you again how that, that works. But basically, you're creating that, clicking the flow button, the flow button and then coming in and creating a, a, a custom action for that list. So you're creating it straight from the list. And then you get started with a couple of steps here. The for a selected item. You know, which is the one that you actually select and run the flow on. And then we do a get item, right, to get all the properties for that particular item. And then, of course, we've got this little variable here. I'm going to initialize a variable to hold that channel name for reuse later. Um, quick note about when you are working in flow. If you don't do it often, this is a key thing I, I can't stress enough, is to always rename 
your actions, rename the steps. So initialize variable is the generic name that this comes with, but um, this is something that you're going to want to rename so that you know exactly what it does, right? So we're going to initialize that variable, and then we're going to come in and use a team action here to post a message in the team. And what I'm saying here is notifying everybody in the team that, you know, Ashley, for instance, this me has requested a new marketing channel, please review. So this is a notice that you're going to be waiting for that approval. So if we're working in teams, you're going to see that first. And then, of course, we have our start and wait for approval step here. So I want to make sure that um, an approval actually goes out to the right people. You know, for instance, this is going to go out to me, but uh, if you have multiple approvers, you can choose to have a first, you know, first to respond can approve or everybody on the marketing team could, could approve. It's whoever you need to, to put there. And then in the details, just some information to put into that approval, whatever that might be. For the sake of this demo, I'm just putting in the channel name to show that you can put dynamic content as well as you can also type in there. Okay, and then after that, I've got a condition. So this is going to look at the approval outcome, and if it's approved, we've got a yes branch. If it's going to be rejected, we've got a no branch. So on approval, we just create a channel. So this is a really straightforward thing that Flow helps you with. There's connectors already built in for teams. There's um, higher level things like actually creating a team itself that we don't have you know, an easy action out of the box in Flow to do. Um, but this is something really cool, really simple that's already available for you. So after we have that approval, go ahead and we can create that channel. And you can see that I'm selecting the marketing team site, right? So that team, and there's a drop down there that you can use of all of your available teams. And then the display name of that new channel is going to be the new channel variable, whatever's held in there. So we have one question from Dustin. Are there advanced options in any of these steps? So Dustin, I'm not sure if you're looking for something in particular or Oh, yeah. So I think he might be referring to, you know, show the advanced options. So, yes, it's a great, that is a great uh, question. So, for instance, if you hid the advanced options, you don't see all of them. But if you click on show advanced options for this approval in particular, I've put the requester as the created by email address. So this is something that you get. The created by comes from the get item. So that's just something that you might want to do. So always play around with those and look there. I don't think I have any extra goodies in the rest of them. I think that's the only place that there's an advanced option hidden in there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and request one. So I'm going to go ahead and do this for the Healthy Living 2021. Maybe we've got a really good Healthy Living campaign that we, it's going to take us another year and a half to, to set up because it's so amazing. So we're going to click the Submit button. And it's going to open up this panel here on the side. Uh, and you might be familiar with that if you've run flows inside of lists before. Um, if you're new to it, just know that this is something that is going to show up. It's part of the, um, it's part of the experience for running a flow. So I'm going to click Run Flow. And then it gives me notice that we've started the flow to approve the new channel and post a message. Okay, so before I go approve it, let's look at the general conversations. And you can see that at 12.43 Eastern, Ashley Rogers has, create, has requested a new marketing channel, please review. So that is the message that I had sent, you know, to the general, um, uh, the general channel here to let me know that that's happening. If we go over to my inbox, we've got a new channel request, and it's just the regular approval format that you might be used to, but again, the details there is whatever I've put inside the details area for that approval. I'm going to go ahead and approve that. I could supply a reason. I could reject it and supply a reason, and you can, side note, do something with those. So if you reject and you want to send that those reasons, that, that information back to the person who requested this, uh, that's great. So you can definitely do that uh, if you were to expand that flow. So I'll go ahead and submit that. Okay. And now 
there's my Healthy Living 2021. So now we have a new uh, channel that we've created, Simp super simple, very easy. Uh, I think the one thing I glossed over that I just want to call out to everybody, in case they're not familiar, is the way I created the flow from the list is by clicking this flow button here and then create a flow. And then if I click on show more, the one I love to use is right at the bottom here, complete a custom action for the selected item. Very, very cool, very powerful. That's probably my favorite way to create a flow. All right, so that is it for me. Well, you have another question for you. Is Go there a it. way to require the reason an item was rejected? Yes, so inside the flow, if you, um, have another condition there that basically says don't start this approval we'd have another condition above the approval that says if the purpose right that purpose field if that's blank then we don't start the approval and in fact we can send a notification back to the requester that says hey you didn't fill this out um, so that's how you'd handle that in a flow uh, but if you wanted to handle it straight in the uh, list itself you could make that purpose a required field so they couldn't you know they, they couldn't save that item without that so there's two different ways in the list and then also in the flow to send a notice back to the person gotcha Okay, and we've got a question. Did you change the settings in Teams for what members can do? Or is this using their already set member permissions so they can manage this? And I'm thinking we got SharePoint permissions coming into play as well. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking is it's really all about um, what you've got permission to do inside the SharePoint list itself and so that's really about the SharePoint site itself so if you've got a situation where you have team you know members of that team who have access to that team but you don't want certain people for instance requesting a channel um, that's something you might want to set up inside SharePoint and manage those permissions there gotcha and we got lots of questions rolling in, girl. So next one up, what about approval? So I'm guessing that's for um, justification for the approval too. So just like we could require filling in for the rejection, we can require comments for the approval as well, I believe is what Ryan is getting at. Yeah, so if you're saying that you must um, send back um, you must send back commentary to the requester. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head how to require the approver to do that. Um, that's something that's great that, you know, maybe we can look into and provide like a Q&A after, you know, maybe we take a note on that one, Joy, and do okay. like a follow-up um, post or something about that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that would be a great idea too, to, to have to provide that back, that feedback back to the requester. Right, and Christy, no, I don't think you have to change anything on the permissions um, to get this to work. Um, member is the lowest level of permission you can have inside of Teams, um, but then all members can create channels. Oh, I see what you're saying. Not to run the flow, but to create a channel. Yes, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So I think in the real world, Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, in the real world, you probably would have it such that only the owners could create the channels if you were wanting to use functionality like this. Sure, if that's yeah. if that's the question, if it's more team um, Teams permission question, yes, right. Absolutely. And we have a question. I think I'm going to hold it off to the end, Sherman. I see you about uh, starting a flow from a calendar. Um, hold with us on that and when we do Q&A at the end I want to get some input from all the guys and gals on how something like that might look so I'm not forgetting you um, just know we're gonna come back to that and I'm making notes and if I have missed anybody's question I apologize um, don't be shy to shout it out again I'm scrolling through Bob Yes, I think we've got everything covered. That Lisa, I do see you. Um, so I think it was for the ease of demo that Ashley went into the existing request and clicked on it. But yes, for a new person coming in to make a new request, they would go to the list, click new and create one brand new. Um, Ashley kind of jumped in in the middle as the approver 
to approve one that was sitting out there waiting. All right, fantastic. Ashley, thank you so much. Um, we'll give you a few minutes while uh, Terrence and Rob go through to think about how you would start flows from a calendar. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very excited to do that. All right, thanks guys, I appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. All right, next up we have Terrence to talk about, okay, that's how you would do some flow stuff from SharePoint, but what about once we have SharePoint and it's time to do something with that form? All right, uh, good afternoon guys. So in my example, like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to focus on kind of enhancing the end user experience with uh, with forms using Power Apps. Um, I'm starting off in SharePoint. I'm starting off with with, with a list in SharePoint, and, and my example is going to be based around an incident report. So I have kind of an incident report list. I have a, a number of fields um, that I've populated here, and I've probably uh, I've created a number of different incident reports here lately. And I would say in one of my examples, I took about maybe half of the fields um, out of this out of this one client's example that I'm thinking of. So some of these can get very long. And so a lot of the things that I'm focusing on is again end user, but how do we take these these forms that have lots and lots of fields and make them more manageable? If we didn't have Power Apps or something else, we could send our employees um, to the list. We could make them click new, and what they would get presented with would be a default form, uh, out of the box, just SharePoint form. And one of the things I'm showing here is, is obviously it, it does get very long. It presents all the fields to the end users where we might wanna hide and show certain fields. We might wanna organize these fields a certain way. Uh, but from our SharePoint list, I am using a number of different field types. So I'm using a lookup field for my location. Um, I have date fields, text fields, and choice fields. And we're going to kind of see how they go into Power Apps. One of the ways that I could do this is I could, since I'm in the list right now, I could click Customize with Power Apps. And I'm, I'm not going to do that. That's not my focus for today. I, I've done demos like that before in previous uh, webinars, so I'm going to switch it up a little bit. But what that would allow me to do is it would replace this default um, form here on the right-hand side with a Power Apps one that we could customize any way that we wanted to. The way that I'm going to approach this, though, is I'm going to kind of start from scratch. If, if I wanted a standalone, either an application or just a place for a form that's um, that's going to look at and use this list for a data source, but not necessarily be directly connected to it here where we're at inside of SharePoint. So to do this, I would start in Power Apps and I can get there a number of different ways. I, I could click on um, the apps icon here, go to all apps and get to Power Apps this way. Um, but basically I am in uh, make.powerapps.com. I would then click on my uh, Canvas app from blank. This is a Canvas app. I would tell it whether I wanted a, this to be for a desktop or a mobile device. Um, and, and, and I kind of got myself set up with a blank one here. It just takes a little bit to load. So I thought with a time constraint, I'd, I'd kick one off here. So I'm in Power Apps now. I have a Canvas. Uh, my first step would be to create a form and connect to that SharePoint list. So if I go to Insert to Forms, and edit form. I would then need to tell it where my data is going to, where my data source is. So on the right hand side here in properties, I could say incident report. Now I've taken a couple of shortcuts here. One, there is connections. I would say this connection is in, in SharePoint. It would make me select the site I'm trying to find and the list I'm trying to pull from. So again, time constraints, I already kind of connected to that list. It's, it's pretty easy once you're here. Power Apps is going to kind of guess at a couple things. It's going to first see that list and guess at the fields that I want to pull from it. It doesn't automatically bring them all in. So I might want to rearrange them. I want might want to move fields, um, hide fields, show additional fields. But it gives me kind of a starting point here. Um, with the number of fields that I have, I already told you my focus is on the end user. And so one of the things I want to do is to help to, to separate some of these fields out, just make it more visually appealing to the end user so they're not just seeing a, a, a ton of fields at once. I'm going to do this a number of different ways. Um, one way is I'm going to click on this edit fields and the ellipsis, and I'm going to add a custom card. Each of these fields from SharePoint ends up being what they call a card here in Power Apps. So a card consists of a, of a space here in my form, 
It consists of a label, text box or drop down, maybe an error message. So a card holds a number of different um, things inside of it. Um, whenever I add a new field like I just did, that custom card comes to the very bottom of this list. This list is also the order that my fields are in. So if I wanted to rearrange any of these, like this custom card, I can click on it and drag it any place that I want. I'm going to drag it all the way to the top. And now we can see our form kind of rearranged here on the, on the canvas. I can select that card, uh, resize it. This is kind of the you know, easy part, just messing around with uh, how you want it to look. I might change the background color. Again, kind of give me a heading, put a label on there. Maybe I'll label this one um, location information, right? Where I'd keep going through and, and separating my form out. I'm gonna just do this one more time kind of real quick before I move on to another example. So I might put another one, where's it at here? Maybe here. I put it right before the employee because this one I'd kind of do the same thing. I'd resize it. I'd give it a colored background. I'd add a label and maybe call this employee information. So something really simple, just breaking this apart, um, adding a, a both a separator and a label, though very easy, will make it a lot better for the end user. All right, I'm gonna step away from that one and I'm gonna go into one that I've kind of fully developed here. Now this is the same exact form, kind of same example. Um, in Power Apps, uh, and again, when we do these webinars, we get a wide variety of people that Maybe I've worked with Power Apps before, maybe others that haven't seen it at all. So I just want to touch on a couple of things. One, Power Apps uh, deals with what they call screens. So over here on the left hand side, I have four different screens. And you can see as I click on them, I get to see some different examples. So on my first screen, this is more of like an incident report kind of app. I see incident reports that have already been submitted, but I also see a couple of buttons for filling out additional forms. Now I have multiple buttons because I want to give you multiple examples. So one is, um, let me play this here. One is what I'm just calling the long form. So this is that same form, except they've already gone through and put the separators in there. I've also gone through and added some dynamic content. Um, let's take location for a, for a uh, second. So this is a drop down, just a choice field. Actually, this one's a lookup in the SharePoint list. Um, I'm gonna pick a location, San Francisco. Okay, so we don't see anything happen right now, but I want you to make a note of that of that area because we're going to see something uh, based on that selection here in just a second. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom because my other example for dynamic content is this drop down. Uh, did the employee seek medical treatment? So if I click the drop down and I say yes, there may be additional fields that need to be filled out. So again, this is where it's a, kind of an improvement on that SharePoint list because I'm not seeing every field. I only see the ones that are important based off of uh, maybe my, my selection of yes in this case. Uh, okay. Um, in Power Apps, there are three different modes of a form. Okay, so there's the new form, there's the edit form, and then there's a view form. Okay, so I'm not changing screens. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to one of these that I've already submitted and I'm going to go to the display. Okay, so this is the exact same form in Power Apps. We've just told it to be a view form now, so it's not editable. And the, one of the first things I want to mention is that top section, that location information. So based on that uh, location selection, Sacramento, now I'm seeing additional fields. Because this is a lookup field in SharePoint, it was automatically connected to a locations list that has address and city and state and zip. So now it's pulling that information in. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to, oh, let me check on one thing here. Yep, that's fine. Great. So now I'm going to go back to um, edit the, the, the uh, canvas and look at some of these fields. So if I select one of my, the card, my location card, and I look at my properties, my advanced properties, there is a property called visible. Now I can either see that here on the right hand side, I can also click on my properties list and see visible here. But now we can see it says, if long form, which is the name of my form, mode is equal to new, false. So, so don't display, don't be visible. If it is, true. So that's why when we filled out this form as a new form, we didn't see these fields because we wouldn't want our end users to see a field that 
that nothing happens to, right? It doesn't automatically show up or isn't doing anything. So they, they would think that there was information maybe that wasn't working on the form. But because we're adding just visibility, now it's a, a, a seamless kind of integration. So let me scroll down here. So again, we're in the display, but this was our yes selection. So now I'm going to click the phys uh, physician's name card, and they also have a visibility, except this one says if DD medical treatment, which is the name of this drop down field, dot selected dot value. So the selected value of that drop down field is equal to yes, then true, then show that field if not false. All right. Uh, let me show a couple other things along those same lines. Uh, let me jump back and forth here just a second. I'm going to go back into a new form. So see the submit button? On the visibility or on the view uh, form, that submit button was not there. I, I want to come so you can see it first. So again, we're doing the same thing here. Visible, if the long form display mode is edit, then we want to show that submit button. But if we're just looking at the view form, we're going to hide that submit button. So showing and hiding our buttons again, based on the type of form that we're in. All right, so the long form was one example and that, that may work. Uh, our form isn't really long, but it could be two or three times longer. There could be a lot more fields that definitely deal with a lot of large forms. So another option would be more of a tabbed design. So this is that exact same form, except now I'm dealing with tabs. So employee information project information, treatment information. Again, same form, okay? Just another way to display it. Now this one also shows, I didn't hide this one, I didn't hide this on purpose. So you can see like location address, city, state, and zip. Those fields were not hidden on the new and you can see what it would look like to an end user if we just left it kind of the default view. It'd be like, why are those there? I don't see any, you know, logical information here. So that's why we're hiding them until they populate. Um, okay, let me go back to the canvas and show you how these tabs work. So each tab, so I'm on the location tab, there's a uh, property for on select. So every time I select this tab, it's updating a variable. It's updating a number of variables. So this update context function, a variable name location selected, which you could call it anything you want to. Location selected was the name that I gave it, is set to true. So when I click on that, set that variable to true, set the rest of these to false. Okay, and there's one for employees selected, project select, one for each of the tabs. So as I go through these tabs, they're all doing basically the same thing. They're selecting their value as true and the rest of them as false. Then the second part of that is now I can select each of my cards. And again, using that same thing we were doing before with visibility, I put that variable here. So selected location. So if that variable is true, it shows that field. And if it's false, it hides it. So as we're going through each of these, it's just showing or hiding the uh, corresponding fields for each of those tabs. All right, the next thing I want to show is um, I kind of made mention to this, but there's those three different types of forms, those form modes. So when we tell it to create a form or to go to a screen with a form, we need to tell it what mode to open in. So and when I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, have, go ahead. I have a question for you about that. Yeah. Uh, Jake would like to know is long form dot mode part of a Power Apps object model? It's part. Uh, um, I guess I would say yes. It's one of the properties that goes with a form. Works for me, Jake. Uh, that work for you? So in the in the two forms that we have, and again, I just created two forms for demo purposes. You you would pick one or the other. Um, you can see when we select that button, we're telling it we we need a new form for that long form, opposed to an edit form or a view form. So we're telling we need long form to be set up and ready to go as a new form. And then the second part is we're navigating to the correct screen. So we're navigating to a screen that I've called long form screen, where that new form, where that, the form that I called long form 
is set up in, for as a as a new and new form mode. So the same thing for tabbed, right? Get that tabbed form ready for the new form mode, and then navigate to that screen so we can see it. And the rest of these buttons for display, you can see there is a view form or an edit form telling it to do those same things. So if we look at, here's my long form, okay? Same form for all three of those, we're just telling it what mode to open that form up in. Um, okay, so two other things I wanna mention. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. I forgot to take a peek, so let me know if I'm going too long here. Uh, one is cascading. I get a lot of questions on cascading, and I didn't fit it into my form, so I kind of created a standalone uh, screen for it. I have two drop downs. One is a drop down that's pulling from my, uh, I have a list called states, and we can, um, if we went back here to SharePoint, you can see the list called states. I just have a few of them in there. There we go. And there's an, also a list called locations in here as well. So in this drop down, we're pulling in a list of all the states. And in this drop down, we're uh, using the items property and we're pulling from locations, but we're doing a filter on it. So filter locations. So the state column in the, in the SharePoint list is equal to the value of that drop down. I didn't give it an appropriate name, it's just called drop down three, select a text title. So as I change the states, my dropdown is dynamically changing as well. The other thing that I did here just for kind of show purposes is that these are just labels on the right hand side, but this is using the lookup function. So lookup values from locations based on the selected value of drop down four, that bottom one here. So it's pulling in the address. Or this one's just a little bit more complicated in terms of it's concatenating. It's combining city, state, and zip, along with some spaces and columns. Uh, each one of those is uh, doing a lookup to do that. Very cool. I like that. You know, back in the olden days, I'm going to say it, forgive me, of InfoPath. You know, that was the nice thing is you could kind of make these clean, streamlined forms, only show people what they need to worry about at that point in time and just organize it and beautiful. This looks long time coming with the uh, the gap we have from InfoPath till, till Power Apps. Very cool. Uh, I'm going to try to show one more thing. I think I'm running out of time. I'm going to try, try to show one more thing real quick to kind of tie in the flow topic with Power Apps is that you can kick put your, uh, excuse me you can kick off your flows from power apps so i get a lot of questions on forms and printing forms um forms don't print very well uh, i know microsoft is working on adding some some uh, additions to that but it basically just prints like a browser would print it'll cut things off it, it doesn't look real pretty so this button here um if i any button or icon I can go up to action and flow and click on one of my flows and I'll show that here real quick in a second uh, and put in any properties that that flow might need like it needs the ID for the record that we're on and it's using the current user's email address and it sends those values to flow for flow to run to do whatever it's doing now if you <clears throat> excuse me in my example uh, my flow is Pull up real quick. My flow is getting the item based off that ID. It's creating an HTML file, and and there might there are other ways to do this, but the HTML file allows us to format tables and format my my eventual PDF any way that I want to, styles and colors and things like that. That can be a little bit of a complicated part of it. I'm just doing something really basic here. Then it's using OneDrive to create an HTML file. It's using OneDrive to convert that to a PDF. Then it's attaching that PDF in an email. And uh, that PDF in OneDrive is really just a temporary storage spot. Uh, OneDrive has the ability to convert, which means I have to save that there temporarily. So the last part is I'm deleting that file. 
So again, that, that could be a way to both get a hard copy PDF of this form, but also a printable view of that form as well. Question on that. So talking about views and forms, um, are these forms going to be responsive out of the box? Um, good question. So there, there's a couple of different ways to, to design these. So at the beginning, I just uh, I, I did have to set it to a form um, factor in terms of a desktop application or a mobile device. It is responsive uh, to a certain extent inside of those. Both of them will open up, even if I do a, a, a desktop version and I try to open up my mobile device, it will work, but it's not it's not what I'd call responsive. It doesn't change the form factor and all those things. Gotcha. There are ways to create responsive forms, uh, but you kind of have to build them yourself. You have to go in and, and, and change settings and work with sizes and percentages and things like that to do it. So you can still get the responsiveness. Um, and I know they're. I know they've made improvements on that, and they're continuing to improve uh, improve it. But right now, there's a little bit of work that we have to do. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much, Terrence. Um, and again, guys, we got a, several questions that have come in. I think some of them will make sense to kind of ask them to circle back when we do our Q and A, because we want to make sure our esteemed Rob Windsor has time for his demo as well. All right. Sorry, I'm typing. I can't type and talk at the same time. So, Terrence, if you're at a good spot, I think we'll ask Rob to jump in. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. All right, let me uh, share my screen. Let me know when you can see that. Yep, we'll see it. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so. Um, you can see a list here in this webinar uh, called webinar documents. Um, it's a this is a, a completely contrived example, but it 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 suits the the demo and the things that I want to show. Um, so basically, in this uh, sorry this library, the important thing is that we have um, the SharePoint version number. So this is the internal version number that SharePoint tracks for us, and then we have this custom column in which we also want to store the version number. Now, why we don't want to do that is not important to the demo. Um, we just just make sure, you know, let, let's let's just assume for the purposes of this that we just want to keep these values in sync. And we're going to do that using Flow. All right, so um, over here in Flow, I have several versions of my Flow, but let's just start with this one here. And what I'm going to do is um, this this could be on a timer, or it could be triggered when a new item is added or an item is modified. But for the demo, I'm just going to use a manual trigger. And what we want to do is go to the webinar documents library and get the file properties for all of the documents in the library. And then we want to take the results coming out of this action and filter them to find um, the items where the version numbers are different. So where SharePoint's internal version number is different than the value in the current version field. And for any item uh, that matches that, then we wanna iterate through those and we wanna update the version number. Uh, the, sorry, the value in the current version field. So, I'm, I'm using this SharePoint REST API call, uh, this validate update list item call, because that will update the current version field without actually updating uh, updating SharePoint's internal version number. Um, so, because if we were trying to keep the version numbers in sync, if if the internal version number updated as I was trying to update the current version, then I would they would still be out of sync. Um, so that's why I'm using the SharePoint REST API call. Um, to achieve that result. And that is the base flow that we're going to start with. So if I come over to my library here, and let's just open up um, this document, and let's make a quick edit to it. So we'll add in edit three, 
and make sure that's saved. And then let's go to the first document here and do a similar process. So this will be edit six and that's saved. And then if I reload here, we should see that the first document, the version numbers are out of sync and the same thing with the last document. So if I come over to my flow here and I manually trigger the flow, we should see that the um, flow completes. And if I come back over to my library, we can see that the version numbers have now been synced. So my flow is running um, as expected. All right, so let's throw a little bit of a curveball here. So let's do the same thing. Let's open up uh, the last document and make an edit. And it's saved. And then let's open up the first document and make an edit and it's saved and again we will see that the version numbers are now out of sync for the first document and the last document um, but now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to open up the first document and leave it open all right so now let's go over to our flow here and um, let's run it And this time we'll see that the flow fails. And um, the reason the flow failed is because the flow tried to update the version number or the current version field value. Um, but what SharePoint is going to tell us is that, and if I scroll over here, um, the file, and then it's going to show us the file URL, so document one, is locked for shared use by me. Okay, because the document is open in the editor, SharePoint is saying, well, you're trying to update a field value on that document, but somebody else is currently working on the document, so I'm not gonna let you do that, okay? Um, now, there are several ways we can find out whether or not the flow ran successfully or not. Uh, for one example, we can go into the page for the flow and we can see the flow runs and we can see here, I, I ran this as a test, so it says test failed. Um, but if I ran it, uh, if, if the flow ran like on a timer or something like that, you would, you would just see that it failed. And then uh, you would be able to click on it and see the flow run history as I just showed you uh, to be able to determine why, why it failed. And then the error details are shown over here on the side. That's what I showed you just a moment ago. So that's one way. Um, up here at the top, you can see flow notifications. And this takes a little bit of time to show all of the recent activity. But in here, you can see um, a little bit about what flows ran recently, which ones succeeded and which failed. So that's another option that you have. Um, and then finally, if you have a premium flow license, you can go into the flow and take a look at the analytics for that flow. And you can get a lot of additional information in terms of the usage of the flow or errors that occurred um, specifically by day or by type uh, and, and specific information about those errors, okay? So those are all things that are, are available to you in terms of what you can use in the UI to be made aware of errors. But in all these cases, you have to go into um, Flow in some way to take a look and see, did, did these things work or did they fail? And really what we wanna do in this case is just make the um, owner of the Flow aware that an error occurred via email so that they can know that they, they can know that right away. So what I can do is I can modify my flow to send an email if a, that specific error occurs. So in this case, I'm I'm concerned about a specific error happening, 
And it's the error where we try to update the current version field value and um, the, the, the document or, or SharePoint for some reason does not allow us to do that. So one thing I've added is this variable, it's an array and it will store the, the file name of any documents that fail to get updated properly. This action remains the same. The filter action remains the same. Here's our apply to each. The update process using the SharePoint REST API remains the same. What I've added then is a new action down here that um, adds the current file name. So we're using the file name with extension value provided to us by Flow for the current um, uh, uh, document library item. I wanna add that into the failed documents array that I created up here. Now, I don't wanna do this in all cases. I only wanna do this when the action above fails. So I can go to the ellipsis for this action and choose configure run after, and I can say don't run this if, it's, if the previous action succeeded, only run this if the previous action failed. So by default, when you add any action, it'll look like this. It'll, the, the action will only run if the action that precedes it runs successfully. But in this case, we want to um, have it so that this action runs if the previous action fails. Um, and this is also indicated, if you can see, it's hard to see because of the plus icon, but the lines connecting the two actions is a red dashed line as opposed to a black solid line. And you also see this information icon here um, that tells us um, that the configure run after is, uh, it has been updated. Uh, and then once I have the array of documents that, that failed, uh, well, first off, I can check to see, were there any documents that failed? So I can check to see, is the length of that array greater than zero? And if it is, then I can send an email, in this case, I'm sending an email to myself, to indicate that um, they could not update the current version field for the following files. And then this is the formatted, so basically each file name will show um, on a different line. So I'm using the join action here to join the, um, the file names together, separating the, each of them by um, a carriage return line field. So at this point, if I run this flow, and you notice I still have document one open, it'll indicate the flow ran successfully, but if we come here and take a look at the send email, we can see that an email was sent. Right, and if I come over to my email here, there is the email that was sent. So could not update the current version field for the following files, document one. Notice that's the document that's open. Um, and what I've also added, uh, and this will only work for the owner or any, anybody who's designated as the owner of the flow, um, but a link where I can actually go see the flow run history. So there is a well-known uh, pattern expression you can use that will find information of the, the, the flow maintains about itself, which you can use to compose that link to get you to this place. So um, as the flow owner, I can go in and get right to the flow run history and investigate um, exactly what happened. All right, so that's an example of handling a specific error. Now, we could do much more complex things and just notify the user. So for I have an example over here, which, which I'm not going to go into in, in detail, but I just do wanna show you um, what's possible. So here I have a loop um, and I'm gonna send a request to SharePoint. Um, and again, notice that the action that immediately precedes that is configured to run um, uh, either if it's successful or failed. So in both cases, in this case. Um, and what I wanna do 
is capture information that that is going to be given back to me about the status code. So this is at any time you make a call to SharePoint, the, the, the answer that comes back will have a status code and that status code will indicate whether the call succeeded or it failed. And if it failed, why, a little bit of information about why it failed. Um, and then I'm looking for specific status codes and error messages to determine how I want to proceed. And if I find the ones I'm expecting, that means that I just had the exact same error I, I showed you where we tried to update SharePoint, but the document associated with that um, uh, list item was open. So what I wanna do is just wait for 15 minutes. Um, otherwise, this completed successfully, so I just wanna stop the, the loop that I showed you here. So we can do very complex things in terms of error handling um, or, or very simple things like we had, whoops, sorry, over here, where we just did a notification. Question on that notification. Would only the owner get the email or would only the owner see the link that's part of that notification? Well, that's really up to you when you compose the um, email. So going down here, right? So. Um, I've specifically said, send this email to me. Um, so you have control over who receives the email. Um, if, if I sent this link to somebody who wasn't an owner, they would still see it. But when they clicked on it, uh, Flow would not allow them to, uh, to see the, the run history. Makes sense. All right. Any other questions out there, guys, on this? Any other goodies you want to show us before we open up the floor for Q&A? Yes, I do. Um, so okay. one thing that, that was specific error handling. I just want to show you a quick example of generic error handling. So there are some times where you could potentially get an error that you don't anticipate or you're not aware that potentially could occur or that only occurs very, very sporadically. Um, so this sort of pattern for flow is one that's pretty common in the industry now. It, uh, you'll see a lot of people talking about this on um, forums or in blog posts and so on. And these actions here are all what, what are called scopes. Uh, so what you can do with the scope is it can contain other actions. So generally what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a main scope where the body or the main functionality of your flow lives. Um, and then you can have a success scope down here so if there's anything you wanna do in terms of cleanup or finalization, if everything above succeeded, you can put that into this scope. Uh, and then you can also have a fail scope. So I've got parallel branches here. Um, and again, notice that this is configured to run after a failure. So what happens is if you have actions inside of a scope, if any of them fail, the fact that something inside of this scope failed will get passed on to um, the next action past the scope. So I can trap, I can catch that here. And then just like before, I can go ahead and send uh, an email indicating that there was a failure. Um, in this case, it would be any kind of failure. So if anything failed at all, just let the person know and then they can go in and inspect, okay, what actually failed? Right. Um, so in this case, I won't know what documents specifically didn't work. I'll just know that the flow failed and I'll have to go and investigate and, and find that out. So one final run here. I'll go ahead and run this. And done. And over here, you'll see that I have now I have an email indicating there was an unhandled exception in the flow that accepts current version numbers. And again, as the flow owner, I can go in and, and investigate that. Um, so that's a, a very quick example of how you can do generic error handling. You can even get more detailed if you want to. Um, I have a blog post on my personal blog, which talks about this in general, but also goes into a little bit more detail on how you can get a little bit of information coming out of the um, scope about what exactly failed. Now, this is pretty complex and it, I, can't, I can't go into the details in, in the time we have available, but I believe, Joy, you have a link uh, to this, this blog post in an upcoming slide so people can go in and take a look at that and investigate it. 
Yes, I sure do. And we will make slides available to you guys as well as a recording of this. Um, so, okay, Rob, fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So we had some questions that I wanted to circle back to. One, I think it's kind of relevant for anyone interested in Power Apps and I'll, I'll open it up for Flow as well. Um, if you guys have some recommendations for resources for getting started with either Flow or Power Apps, um, maybe drop that in chat and send it out or um, put it as a question for everyone, something like that, maybe some thoughts on places you can go to get started or shout it out, whatever you think's easier to share that information with everyone that's hanging on the line. And I think I got that handled. Where to add the JSON, Ashley, the super secret JSON code that you had for your <laughs> submit button. Yeah, so can I share my screen again? Here, let's... Absolutely. I'll go ahead and make myself a presenter. Mm -hmm. I know we are a minute over. We thank you for hanging on the line. If you have to drop, we're going to keep recording during this. So once the recording's available, you can just pick back up where we needed to leave off. We do want to be respectful of your time, but we also want to answer as much as we can here live for you guys. So, uh, uh, Joy, can you guys see my uh, my site here, Northern Traders Marketing? Yes, ma'am. All right, great. So uh, this is not the same example as before, but it is the same um, concept. So if you need to add the JSON column formatting, which I did post as an answer to everybody in there. So if you uh, scroll through, everybody should be able to get to that um, link that I posted. Um, so in here, all you do is create a single line text column. We're gonna call this JSON formatting. You can call it like submit button or, you know, send for approval or something like that that makes sense for you. And then in here, so in our new uh, field here, we just hit the drop down and we can go to column settings and then we hit format this column. And that's where you have, you know, that you can actually paste your JSON right in there. So what I typically do is I build it, you know, I take that example that it's in the link uh, from Microsoft, I take that and then I build my JSON inside of like Notepad or another text editor. Um, and then once I'm sure that it's that it's right and there's no errors or whatever, so then I paste it in here and then you can click on preview to see what it looks like or save to commit those changes. Um, and that's what you would do. It's the same area that you would add any formatting for a column, um, say to you know make it turn red for a certain value or something like that. So, so that's how you get to that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. JSON adds magic to SharePoint columns, that is for sure. <laughs> Let's see. You know what I was thinking too, Ashley, with the flow that you've got for the channels, I could see that being useful because Teams is awesome for collaboration, for communication, but it's not really a document management platform. We still need SharePoint for that. But I could see with the flow you did, being able to post messages back and forth, having those approval flows set up, putting a tab into the appropriate Teams channel, and being able to see in Teams chat when something's submitted for approval, for review, and doing some of that actual document management stuff. Oh yeah, brings the life cycle right straight into, into Teams. Love it, love it. All right, calendar flows and go. Sure. <laughs> Who wants to take that on? So, I mean, so I did work on this uh, while the other guys were um, were talking. Uh, do you, do Rob or uh, Terrence, do you wanna add anything to that before I talk about it? Go for it. Um, no, go, go ahead. Um, All right. I'll, I'll uh, add to it if I, if I have anything. Sure. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, Joy, pipe in if, if you got some input on this as well. Um, but, you know, you guys might know that there's no more of the, you know, that classic calendar view that you might be used to um, from classic SharePoint. That's not really in modern anymore, right? So it's an, it's an events list. Um, and what you might be referring to is that when you go to an events list, um, there's really no 
you know, ribbon-ish kind of thing here for you to do anything with. There's nothing I can sort of click on to find flow or things like that. So that's probably where part of this is, is stemming from. Um, in addition to that, uh, when you do make the connection to a site and then you click on the list, you know, the list name, my events list, for instance, was not part of my selections. It didn't want to just sort of naturally connect to the events list. Um, so my way around that was to open up my events list. What I did was I clicked see all from the web part, from the events web part. And then I'm in here and you can see up here in the URL, and remember that URLs are amazing in SharePoint. You can get so much information from them. It's the list GUID. So I just pulled out the list GUID here I just copied and pasted all that. And then I, I went in here and instead of using the drop down, there is, let me show you guys if I X out of that. So you can see that customers, new channel request and vendors is what's available to me. Um, so instead I hit enter custom value and then I pasted that GUID right in there. And that actually lets you make the connection to the events list itself. So it's a bit of a workaround. You don't have, you know, my favorite way of creating a flow straight from inside the list. Um, for instance, I did have to create, you know, this flow from a trigger that was when an item is created, but you could pick a different trigger. Um, but that's your way around it. That's the way to connect to the events list. So I'll go ahead and test it again for you guys just to see that it does in fact uh, connect there. You can see that it's been successful and we get all the response information back here. So so that's how you would do that. So question, is it GUID or GUID? <laughs> I always say GUID. <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> just curious. Uh, let see. Um, I think that brings us up to date on the questions from as you guys were going through. <laughs> we, we got an opinion coming in. Goo-id. See, I always think like, I don't say squid for squid. I say squid. So squid, that's, that's my thought. But I'm not a developer. So maybe that's a dev admin division <laughs> the Divide. internal debate <laughs> it is it is any other questions out there guys a um, lot of good info in this um, I appreciate you three being here doing all the heavy lifting I'll be real I didn't have to do anything but put some slides together for this and it was fantastic um, so I appreciate that I'm going to put the closing slide up but that doesn't mean oh are there examples available online Yes. Um, are there or are these examples available? Are the, oh, these. See, that's what happens when you don't read well. Um, the demo examples. So when we, it's going to be a mixed bag. Um, Rob's is in his blog. So, and the link to that is in the slides. Um, Ashley, I know you, you, probably don't have a whole lot of free time in your life but when you do there might be a chance some of this could be uh could be out there somewhere on the interwebs right sure maybe a blog post or two maybe right <laughs> so look for that <laughs> look for that the slides will be available they're not quite yet um but as you can see i've got the steps through on ashley's pieces and then for Terrence's part, there will be the recording. So you can go through and not just have pictures, but actually have him stepping you through. So all that will be available. And for our contact info, again, I've got our Twitter handles here. Um, and remember, in closing, with great power comes great responsibility. That applies to all of all of the power platform as well as uh, your admin access inside of Office 365. Use it well, um, but there's great stuff out there to do. I'm so glad you joined us for our Back with Power webinar. Um, not seeing any new questions, so I'll go ahead and go on silent for a few minutes, if, give you a chance to get some last minute questions in. Uh, but thank you, thank you. Appreciate you all joining.
Rob, Terrence, Ashley, thank you so much for the work you put into this and your demos. No problem, thank you. Yeah, right. glad to do it. My pleasure. Everyone have a great rest of the week.